Okay, uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, this is called Free Open Source LTE IMSI Catcher. Um, it's also a word joke in Hungarian because Fosh means in Hungarian crap, so it's kind of like a, it's a crappy thing, uh, but I think it's interesting and I felt like it works good enough that it should be presented, but uh, as always be aware because all the stuff and software I touch is usually really, really unreliable and this is not an exception of that rule. So, uh, and also there is a fair warning. It's not going to be that kind of IMSI catcher that you have heard in the media, which are doing men in the middle and acting acting as the victim towards the network and, and listening to calls and eavesdropping data and stuff like that. That's not the one. This is going to be a classic IMSI catcher, which is only going to do IMSI catching and then releasing the client, the user equipment back to the original network. So these are not the droids if you're, lo you're looking for, if you thought so. <coughs> so, uh, we've been hearing a lot of stuff about GSM IMSI catchers in the past couple of years, thanks to the media, thanks to Snowden, and thanks to all the hype that's surrounding security. So what is a GSM IMSI catcher? Just to recap, so what's, what's the technical uh, understanding behind it? We are creating a fake base station. A fake base station is a piece of radio equipment usually uh, coupled with software running on the laptop. There are many different projects that, that uh, deal with this. Uh, for example, OpenBTS or OpenBSC, uh, just to, to just name one. So we are creating this fake base station, which is mimicking all the information of the original base station. When I say information, I mean it mimics the uh, mobile network code, mobile country code. So it mimics all the information that the phone uses to identify to which mobile operator the station uh, belongs to. And we have these special values, which are called reselection values in GSM, C1 and C2, referenced in the uh, standard. And they are what they do is they actually determine in. Uh, so the phone sees many base stations and, and this, these values are kind of prioritizing them. So who has the highest value and also has a good uh, signal strength will be selected by the phone automatically. And we're using a random location area code which is needed because uh, otherwise we wouldn't notice if a phone connects because the phone just connects uh, to another base station and does nothing uh, by default. But by using a random location area could be forced the phone to actually initiate the so-called location update request. This is mandatory in GSM. You need to uh, update your location in the, in the core network, in the core database, if you are changing uh, location areas. So once the phone initiates that, our fake base station will say back, okay, I don't know who you are, I'm requesting your IMSI, and then the phone will give it give the IMSI. And after that, uh, the base station will send the location update reject, which tells the phone that you are not allowed in this location area, meaning that the phone will actually just disconnect from the fake base station and find another base station, a real one, and connect to that one. So this is ensuring that the phone will never actually come back again, so it's like uh, deduplicating in a way. So, and the cause for that is uh, number 13, but there are many other uh, causes as well, which can cause uh, strange behavior, uh, last year or two years ago, I presented uh, a talk which, which uh, went through these causes and there are causes that can make your phone simply uh, disable itself or actually disconnect from the network and uh, stay in deregistered mode. So you will not be able to receive calls or make calls until you either reboot the phone or remove and put back the SIM or just turn on airplane mode and turn it back off. So you can do many different things with it. And of course, as in GSM, uh, and not, it's not authenticated, that's why you can do it. In GSM, there is no mutual authentication between the network and the phone. So only the phone is authenticated, meaning that whatever the network says or does, it's always uh, trusted. It's, it's, it's thought as of, a, of as a trusted source. And of course, there is also, uh, if you think about it, if you want to reject a phone or, or a client, your message needs to be unencrypted and also unprotected because there is no way to ensure security context with a phone that, for example, has no SIM card. So you have no way of actually protecting this message. This will be always easy to falsify and send it out. At least, at least that's how it looks like at, uh, right now as well. And also, uh, 
from this uh, we seen an, an um, evolution of IMSI catchers because of many other things for example the cryptography which uh, Piotr even mentioned that there is no crypt cryptography also allowed in the standard stuff like that it allowed many in the middle uh, quite easily since you once you have the phone connected to you to your fake base session it's easy to do many in the middle as well if you, if that's your intention so then of course the question arises so what happened in LTE how does it look like is it better anyway uh, because it seems like that uh, mm, in contrary to GSM LTE is going to be a global standard at least it looks ri li like right now because it's in the US it's in Europe and it's in, it's in Asia as well uh, you remember in GSM we, we have some, there are some GSM operators in the US but they also use CDMA 2000 and stuff like that so it's complicated it's not that easy but LTE seems to be bringing together uh, the whole globe under one umbrella to say and here you can see the architecture of it it's uh, it's kind it's kind of it's kind of an, an easy system to understand at least i would say so so we have uh, ues which are uh, here on the left uh, your left yeah that's right uh, so your left these are user equipment so phones um, stations that they can be any it's it's uh, it's intentional that we're not saying phone we are saying user equipment because it doesn't need to be a phone actually you can can be usb modem or whatever we have e node b's uh, which are uh, evolved node b's node b was the standardized name in 3g so it just evolved from that a lot of the e's which you can see in the front of all these uh, short uh, names they are just meaning evolved because they are actually using 3g terminology so e node b's are the radio towers and they have ip connection back to the core network uh, hopefully all operators are using IPsec but it's not definitely mandatory so it could be set up without IPsec uh, but yeah so these are like fiber cables or whatever connections back to the packet core the EPC evil packet core and inside that we have the MME which is a, a mobile manager entity and we also have uh, different gateways like serving gateways and packet gateways and stuff like that and we also have the customer database so it's it's a complete core network and of course it has a connection towards the internet or the public switch telephone network also known as the landline phone and other mobile operators so the architecture looks like this and it's it could be uh, split into two on the left we have the EU trend which is the radio area network and we have the core network which is the EPC or Evolve Packet Core so and the things that we're going to talk about is mainly the e node b's because these are the radio towers and also about the core network a little bit so what's changed in lte mutual authentication has been already introduced in 3g but it has been hardened in lte it uses integrity protection for all the messages uh, that could be integrity protected so once the phone actually has a a security context established all the messages should be integrity protected and maybe also encrypted it depends on the network a lot of networks use only integrity protection but no encryption i will not say anything about that that's also allowed in the standard they thought integrity protection should be enough but actually it looks not that bad i guess uh, as i said most most procedures require uh, AS security enabled so integrity protection should be in place and the UE should just simply drop uh, non-protected messages so even if I have a fake base station broadcasting uh, and the UE comes near me with a security context established already with the real operator network it will just simply disregard my messages because they are not integrity protected so it should be fine right I mean what, what could go wrong no it's not fine sadly <laughs> What if I told you that there is a way to delete the security context from the phone without any authentication or anything? So there is a single message, or at least more messages, but there is at least one message that you can send from your fake base station and it will just make the phone delete all the security context and, and start uh, accepting unprotected messages. Well, there is one. Thanks, the nice sound effect. So there is one, and uh, it's again with the tracking area and the reject stuff, because the rejects need to be unencrypted, unprotected, right? So, and it's been defined in such way that you can specify cause number nine uh, uh, with, with a rogue e-node B. And I 
have this excerpt from the standard. So it looks like that, that once the phone uh, gets a message with cause 9, what it should do is delete any temporary identifier, delete the last visited tracking areas, and also delete the EKSI, which is the key, essentially, the mutual, the, uh, the key that they agreed on, the session key. And the UE shall enter into deregistered mode and also uh, automatically try to reattach itself. So cause 9 actually means UE identity cannot be derived by the network, so this cause is actually I guess a legitimate cause, because there could be a situation where the MME crashed, the database was lost, and then a UE just tries to reconnect to it, although in such case I'm not sure if you would actually have a UE and you would be alive to do it, because this stuff rarely crashes, I guess. But let's say there is this situation, and then we need a cause for that, and this, this cause is just telling that I don't know you, uh, so you should just delete all the keys, delete all the uh, security context, and connect back to me. Uh, this is not a finding of mine. This has been in a paper last year by Ravi Shankar Borgankar and Altaf Sheikh. They have been doing massive uh, uh, research on LTE protocol security and they presented this as Black Hat and also at another conference in Finland. But I don't think many people read about it or heard about it. But uh, So I thought it would be interesting to bring this up. So what happens next? Now we have a phone that, can, uh, that accepts messages without integrity protection, so no more key or security contacts in the UE. So now the UE will initiate an attach, and of course, during an attach, it's allowed to ask for an IMSI, because how, how else would you attach your phone to the network without knowing the IMSI? The, you need the IMSI to actually be able to gather the keys from the database. So of course, we will just ask for an IMSI like a nice guy, uh, please give me your IMSI, the phone will hand over the IMSI, and after that, we can just simply uh, reject the, the whole attach uh, procedure, saying that that uh, this tracking area is not allowed. So we have the same cause as in GSM, which was location area not allowed. Now we have now we call it tracking area not allowed. So we can just simply say this is not allowed, and the phone will just hand go back to the original network. So what's the hardware and the software I'm going to use today? You see all of it here on the table. Uh, we have a USRP, which I'm pretty sure most of you are uh, familiar with. It's a software-defined radio peripheral, could be used for any kind of radio transmission. And we have a laptop uh, with fast enough CPU because LTE uses, uh, in some cases, 10 megahertz or 20 megahertz of bandwidth, so you require quite, uh, quite an amount of processing power for it. And we have a lot of open source projects in LTE, which is also a new thing, I guess, uh, compared to GSM at least, because then we had pretty much no project except for what Piotr did. Uh, here in LTE we have different projects. We have Open LTE, which is kind of like a bundle of software tied together, trying to create a whole uh, uh, LTE network. But I didn't really like it because it's just too compact. It's, it has everything uh, in one huge binary, kind of. And it's, it's not having the different uh, uh, roles and, and, and uh, stuff what, what's in LTE architecture defined. But then we have Open Air Interface, which is a university <laughs> project, and this is a full, complete LTE implementation, which has core network components, which has eNodeB components, and it could be connected in any way you want. You can connect like a phone to it, or you can just connect like a simulator to it. They, they are really working on it. The code quality is, is okay, I would say, so I was able to get it running, but uh, definitely needed some tweaking, so, so it's, it's quite usable. And we have SRS LTE and SRS UE, which are uh, which are great libraries for processing LTE messages written in uh, C or C++ if I'm right, C probably. Uh, what I ended up doing is creating an own core network because I'm currently working on this as my uh, thesis for my university studies and, uh, and it, for all the stuff that I'm testing it was easier to create an own core network so that's what I did. So that's that's the other side. So I'm using only open air interfaces E node B as my uh, my uh, radio tower, let's say, and I'm using my own core network uh, to to do this. And um, one more thing that we need to talk about is that you remember in GSM there were these reselection values which could be used to lure the phones in. So you would you would appear as the best cell tower uh, in the in the area. In you know, in LTE it's a little bit different. Uh, what they do is that they have a list of frequencies 
and they assign priorities to all the frequencies and the most prioritized, which is priority 7 uh, frequency, uh, that's, that's the one that will always be monitored by the UE. It's, it's created in such a way that the UE can save power so it wouldn't monitor any of the frequencies, but only the one that's that's the, that's prioritized by the operator. So it's a little bit better than in GSM. You need it to uh, always check out the six best neighbors and try to figure it out. Now you just need to check out one. So this means that if I set the the E node B to this frequency, then the phone will actually find it and probably connect to it. Uh, yeah. So it should be demo time now. And again, I'm saying that this could go terribly wrong because demos are always crap if you're doing it on stage. But uh, let's try it. So there we go. Or not. I guess that's already awesome because my laptop is not putting out. Oh, almost. Yeah. Whoa, there we go. Okay, but I didn't want... This shouldn't be an extended desktop, I guess. Who knows this shitty thing called Ubuntu and Unity? I'm not the one, I guess. Uh, displays, and I want to say... Uh, mirror displays, there we go. Should be magical keep this configuration. Okay, <laughs> you should see my stuff. That's awesome. Okay, so we have our good friend Wireshark, which I will just keep running here in the background. And I will start up the core network first, which could be seen on the screen right now. And I will I already created a configuration file for T-Mobile, so I'm gonna try to impersonate a T-Mobile base station. We're kind of lucky here because here there are no LTE signals because of the walls and so no coverage. So in theory, it should be quite easy to lure phones. Uh, bear with me, I guess. So we have the core network up and running and now I'm going to start up the, the uh, E-Node B. So it's loading stuff, detecting the USRP, and here we have a bunch of stuff, but yeah, here we go. Now now it is running, and here you could see some background info in Wireshark, but that's not interesting right now. Ah, sure, okay. Let me, let me try that. It's gonna be tricky, but... Should be, but... The Hungarian keyboard messes it up, but I can change the profile. I've been doing this for years, so I'm a pro, bear with me. <laughs> Profiles, edit, there we go, colors, no, it's in, I guess. Is it bigger now? I can, I can. Let's do this. There we go, that should be readable. Yeah, so we have an E-Node B connected. This is the local one and it is running currently. So it's like we are hoping for the best, which is like to have at least one phone attached or try. Okay, we have some stuff going on. I hope anyone who has a phone on T-Mobile and has LTE turned on that that that, that one could be and could end up here. Currently that's more Erroneous, I guess, but uh, we can just keep it going. Dinat, is your phone on and is it on T-Mobile and is it on LT? None of those? The last one, it's on Vodafone. You're on Vodafone? I can do that. I have a Vodafone configuration. <laughs> well. Wait, 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 we might have something. Let me check in Wireshark. My T-Mobile searching. Okay, uh, that sounds good. Okay, that's, that shouldn't cause a problem, I guess. The range of this is crap, so it's like really like some meters. Uh, I tried it last night at home and it was like, 
if I went five meters away from the table, then it kind of just didn't work. I need to work on the gains, I guess, in the program. But uh, since DNet is sitting quite close and he has Vodafone, then let me try to impersonate Vodafone and see what happens. Stop it. Okay. I should have a uh, band 7 Vodafone and also have a config here for Vodafone. There we go. And minus D. Let's see what happens now. Okay, let's just wait some seconds, I guess. Yeah. Until then, anyone has any questions so far about anything I said or anyone else said? Yeah. So the priority is not based on the signal power, it's based on the frequencies. It's based also on the signal power and the, and the frequencies in the list. So you need to you need to have at least some. Uh, so it's defined in the broadcast information how much uh, signal strength you need to have that you would be even be considered for for the uh, for the network, I guess. Looks like it's stuck somewhere. Let me check in the logs. Well, it looks good. Oh oh shit! I already had some. It's here. It's right here. Okay. Let me let me get it. It's in the NAS PDU, and here is the identity. That's a T-Mobile one, actually. Ah, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Oh wait, but I am actually outputting this to a file, so you should be able to see it. Yeah, here we have it. Actually, we got two. The funny thing is that now we have two IMSIs and it's like cool, nobody knows if it's his or hers. I, I can't even do it because there is no way to convert an IMSI back to a phone number. So, but actually we were able to catch one IMSI here, which is, I guess it's good. Um, so what are these used for? Mainly they are used for uh, governmental purposes or, or by the police. And what they do is that once they figure out the phone number of a uh, of a criminal, then they, they put up these fake base stations and monitor all the IMSIs around and try to check if the criminal's IMSI pops up and then they know that he is somewhere in the area and then they can, they can track him down. Now the sad thing is that, as you can see, even with LTE, it could still be done. I, can, I could get your IMSI, it's right up here. And, uh, and uh, sadly, the, there was no improvement on this part, at least because of this protocol failure I mentioned. So, let me get back to the last slides, I guess. Here we go, yeah. So, I wanted to say thank you to all these people because uh, they did awesome work. So, Ravi Shankar, Borgan, Colonel Altap for discovering this uh, reject thing and also many other vulnerabilities in their paper. If you want to read, read up on it, I highly uh, would suggest it. It's called the Practical LTE attacks, if I'm, if I'm correct. Also for a French guy, Benoit Michel, for creating a lot of libraries and helpers in Python that I'm using in my uh, core network emulator. And Philippe Langlois and Elvis Pfützenreiter for Pi SCTP. And also uh, the two of my colleagues at Qualcomm who helped me a lot uh, last <coughs> summer during my internship with, uh, with figuring out LTE stuff. That was Kevin and Nico. And uh, I would be open up for Q&A now, I guess, because we are really good on time, so, yeah. Okay, so the question was, are my tools available? Not yet. Uh, I should have put a slide up about that, but uh, so all the open source stuff is, of course, available by the projects. My core network emulator is not yet available mainly because I'm working on it and also there are some licensing issues I need to figure out first. But since it's part of my uh, 
diploma thesis, it should be up once the diploma is published, which should be next year, uh, beginning of next year. So, but also if you look up uh, Benoit's stuff, uh, it's up on GitHub. He also he also has a kind of a core network emulator, which you can use to to uh, try stuff. I guess it could be used for many stuff. I put up his name again just in case. Yes. No, I haven't. I don't know. Your yeah, radio badge, uh, last camp, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I haven't used it. I have seen one in life. That's that's one thing. But uh, uh, currently, so the thing is that uh, LTE can achieve such high uh, bandwidth in terms of uh, data speed by using a large chunk of the spectrum, meaning 10 megahertz or even 20 megahertz. And as far as I know, I'm not sure the radio badge is bandwidth. How much is that? It's but hack it's yeah okay. But I'm, hack RF is like eight megahertz or ten. Could be twenty. But with eight bits. With eight bits, yeah. Uh, it should be usable, I guess. Uh, the thing is that the uh, open air interface is really picky about radio hardware and operating system, so they have like a complete guide saying this kernel needs to be there and this version of Ubuntu. Yeah, I'm, I know. I know. And stuff like that. So that's that's why I didn't really go down that route. But I guess that project could be extended easily because the radio part should be should be easily extendable. I guess it's just a different driver. Ah, okay. Then, uh, well, maybe maybe we'll see. I don't know. But thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, nice. We also, Dinat, we have one one in the hacker space, two, two in the hacker space, right? Both are here in the next yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So we are really well equipped with radio. Oh, okay. Piotr first. Uh, is it possible to patch this uh, problem with uh, protocol in the, the user uh, terminal? No, not really. I guess because that's that's in the standard and it's it's legitimate cause. And there are actually at least. 24 or 30 different EMM causes, uh, evolved mobile mobility causes, and this, and at least two or three of them re say uh, require the same action from the UE, saying that yes, you need to delete your uh, key and yes, you need to uh, try to reattach or whatever. <coughs> so it's put out, put in there for. I guess with, without security, security in mind, because it's an unauthenticated reject message and, and it could cause this kind of trouble. And uh, yeah, so I don't think it could, it could be patched in the standards, but that's, that's not how, that, that would take years to end up in user equipment, I guess. So maybe it's by design, it's there, not uh, Absolutely, sure. It's, it's a hidden thing and, and it's, it's, it's cool that, that Ravi and Alta found it. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 kind of like it's not that hidden, but it's hidden. So if you are really into this kind of theories, it's absolutely possible that it's there on purpose, really. Because as I said, the case of an MME crashing and stuff like that, and then rejecting a UI, I guess, yeah, not that highly uh, highly common, I guess. Yes. Um, thanks. Was really interesting, and I think it's a very important field of research. Uh, I. I hope it won't annoy you, but I'd like your opinion on a very minor semantic point. Sure. Uh, man in the middle attacks, most of the time there's no man. And yeah. If there would be a person, it wouldn't be necessarily a man. So would you speak of person in the middle attack, or thing in the middle attack, because very often it's an antenna or a device, or just in the middle attack? Sure. I, 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 would, I would be happy, because... What, what would you prefer? I would say thing, because that's, that's the most... Generic term I would come up with, yeah. So we would change it to T T I T M, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, sure. No, it's it's right because as I said in uh, in GSM, it was called mobile session, but then changed the user equipment for the same reasons because it's not necessarily the one. So we should name everything with this proper and right name, I guess. Simply intercepting. I mean, that word is already here. Spy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Kind of spy. I understand, but the end of the. It's like the location is now called tracking. It's yeah, accurate. absolutely. In 3G, it's called it's 3G is called roaming area. It, GSM is called location area. Now it's called tracking area. I can't wait for 5G. From location to roaming to tracking. 
Interesting. Yes. How about intelligent beings? Okay. Does the Okay, I guess we are hitting into random discussion, so I will thank you for your attention.